Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm with the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank, and we're here today to talk to you about breaking the logjam on how to pay for infrastructure. So we've had a lot of uh, infrastructure in the news over the month of May, and uh, we would like to cover um, how the National Infrastructure Bank can break this logjam. Uh, the good news is that we have now introduced, reintroduced a bill in Congress, H.R. 3339, to create a $5 trillion infrastructure bank. Um, I've covered before on other webinars how the bank works, and you can go to our homepage uh, to uh, see videos on that, nibcoalition.com. Um, but what I would like to do is to work you through um, what the discussion is on the size of infrastructure spending and how the NIB can complement the spending. So we sized this bank uh, based on estimates from the American Society of Civil Engineers, who just came out with a new report card in March and said that the cost of fixing infrastructure over the next 10 years is $6.1 trillion. Uh, and uh, they assign uh, different categories, different 17 different categories to that. And then furthermore, the engineers break those uh, total needs out into two other components, uh, a funded part and a remaining gap part. These numbers come off of table two of the failure to act report, the 2021 failure to act report. Um, so uh, we, uh, we will have to have uh, spending from the federal budget and state and local budgets, that's this column right here, as well as a bank to cover the remaining gap. Um, I, what I did here was I dropped in the uh, American Jobs Plan, President Biden's uh, initial proposal for infrastructure spending to see how it lined up with what the engineers are saying is our need. And uh, the fact is the Biden plan uh, would cover uh, just under a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure. Uh, that uh, over, over the month of May, uh, there have been a lot of discussions about uh, this, th these com components of this proposal, and uh, Republicans have come back with several counter offers, uh, starting from a very low number, and then most recently, they came up with a counter offer of about $920 billion over a 10-year period uh, to cover, that's their proposal for infrastructure. So you can see that the Republican and the Biden plan proposals are about the same. That's only about $250 billion worth of new spending. So the, the point is that both of these plans fall within the already funded estimation from the engineers. And we still have a remaining gap for infrastructure of $2.6 trillion, we, which we want this bank to, that, to be able to complement spending from the budget and pay for. Um, that has some really large numbers in it. 1.2 trillion for surface transportation and 1.1 trillion for water infrastructure. And then we also expanded our categories of infrastructure to cover uh, affordable housing, a complete um, um, network of high-speed rail across the United States and broadband everywhere and some large water projects. Uh, the, 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 the point we wanted to make uh, with you today is that even after the Biden proposal, even after the Republican proposal, there will still be a lot of infrastructure that is not covered according to the American Society of Civil Engineers. And here are some examples of projects that, that are not yet covered. Uh, first, uh, first and foremost is the Gateway Project. This is a 10 mile project that, that goes from New York to New Jersey, takes rail, uh, rail cars into uh, the city of New York. And it needs uh, new tunnels and new bridges and new stations, uh, all of which would cost upwards of $30 billion. And uh, maybe uh, Biden has promised to cover, maybe covering the, uh, the Hudson River Tunnel, about uh, 12, 11 or $12 million. Uh, but we'll see if he can glean that out of his numbers. Then we have a big problem with uh, lead water service lines, uh, both in the north, uh, northeast and midwest parts of the country. I have another slide on that in just a minute, but uh, it is definitely not covered. For example, uh, Biden put only a, about $45 billion in uh, for lead water service lines, and the, the problem is a lot bigger than that. Uh, then we also have additional drinking water uh, problem, uh, water lines that we need to fix and stormwater overflows uh, nationwide. 
That gap is uh, excluding the lead service lines is $515 billion. This National Infrastructure Bank will be able to cover that. We have uh, roads and bridges that are not financed under either the Biden plan or the Republican plan. Another two, 1.2 trillion is needed for that. We, need, we have freight bottlenecks all across the country, which make uh, trucks and uh, uh, commuter ra- uh, cars uh, moving very slowly. We need to have fix all those freight bottlenecks and important bridges uh, that are components of that. And then uh, we also need to put in high-speed rail. Um, the first place where we really need to start with that is along the Northeast Corridor. That makes sense. We need $135 billion for that. Biden's $80 billion for Amtrak uh, won't cover this. That's mostly for uh, ma- deferred maintenance. Uh, so these are the kinds of projects that are not covered uh, so far. And the National Infrastructure Bank will be able to finance them without new debt and without new taxes, um, and as well as for, for uh, Um, providing uh, comprehensive planning for all of this. I wanted to go back to lead in drinking water. Um, It it is the case that uh, Biden uh, has proposed some money for lead in drinking water. It's not enough. Um, We really need to go to the the Society of Civil Engineers and studies like this one that was done at the University of California, Irvine, uh, which says that we have... uh, serious problem uh, for with lead lines in at least 11 million homes uh, in the Northeast, the Midwest. Uh, the problem, for example, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, they have gone out and done studies uh, comparing to other regions in the area and came up with a price tag to fix their lead water lines, which was astonishingly $12 billion for that one city alone. And since it was so large, just this month, uh, they ask for an, uh, uh, an exclusion to not fix the lead service lines um, and go uh, by the 50-year rule of the um, EPA that said uh, we can have a 50-year grace period to fix these lines. That's just not satisfactory. We really need to get these lines out, uh, fixed and out right, really right away. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimate in their 2020 report card says that we need $286 billion to cover just the lead service lines, plus much more for all the rest of the water infrastructure. This bank will cover um, all of that. Um, Here is uh, uh, another area where the uh, infrastructure bank can really help. Um, Because we have utilities running underneath streets at the same time that we need to, which we all need to fix, at the same time that we need to fix the roads on top, if we could bundle these projects, and bring projects into the National Infrastructure Bank for financing, bundle projects. We could start by fixing the the lowest um, problems, uh, utility problems underneath the roads, the water and sewage, uh, then the drinking water, the the leaking gas lines, the power lines, uh, and before we fix, as before at the same time, we fix all the roads and sidewalks. And if we do that, we'll be able to save money We'll be able to spread the cost of all this infrastructure financing across different balance sheets, according to who owns the infrastructure. And we'll need careful coordination between water utilities and other utilities and departments of transportation. So those are uh, some of the kinds of uh, things that uh, we propose that we think that the bank can really help with. This bank's been done four times in our nation's past. Um, But um, if you would like to see a um, explanation again, as I said, of how the bank works. That that's uh, that's on our website. Uh, but uh, uh, suffice it to say that this bank complements both the Biden and the Republican plans, provides all of the infrastructure financing without any new debt or taxes. Thanks. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Stephen Hubbard, and next I'd like to talk about why the United States needs a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure bank. So there are basically two competing visions of the United or of the United States right now. One is that there is a small infrastructure deficit, and um, the basically the Republican plan is more than generous enough to fix it. And the other is, if you will, sort of like the Democratic vision of, of the infrastructure deficit, that's also supported by the American Society of Civil Engineers infrastructure report card, which in his most recent version said that there was a $2.6 trillion funding shortfall. And so the question is, which one of these is correct? So when I was working on my doctoral thesis, which was on infrastructure banks, um, I actually went through the source documents for the 
previous version of their report card. And every time I looked at a document that talked about um, transportation or water uh, and what were the deficits that they were facing, unfunded portions of, of infrastructure replacement, the over and over again, the American society's uh, estimates were actually below what I felt was actually the real number. So if anything, I found that they had a conservative value, not a liberal value. And so I, and I should add that um, I'm a retired GIS project manager, so I'm not in any way associated with I'm going to make lots of money by paving roads or uh, building additional water supplies or anything like this, is that I have no financial gain. Plus, as I talked to the ASCE, I discovered that they had left many uh, um, uh, different types of classes of facilities out. They don't claim that their um, report card is comprehensive. And so what's missing uh, or they don't include are public housing, government facilities, um, groundwater depletion. I'm a water guy. And 50% uh, of the U.S. food production comes from the California Central Valley and the uh, Plains of Gala Ala Aquifer, both of which the water levels are dropping dramatically. The water has to be put back into these aquifers at somewhere between two and $400 an acre foot, or at least move there. Otherwise, we're gonna have to grow food somewhere else. And there really isn't another location right now. So that has to be replaced. Um, plus, uh, um, just recently, of course, um, re-onshoring of manufacturing that we've lost offshore. We can't build things right now because we don't have microchips. They come from uh, regions that are still recovering from the shutdown, climate change re remediation, deferred maintenance, which is very important. I'll get to that in a minute. That's the basically um, ever, when you don't spend enough money on maintenance, there's a cost um, it's like underpaying the uh, interest on a mortgage. Next time around, you pay interest on the unpaid interest. And uh, when you add all, all these together, you come up with somewhere between 4.2 to $7.6 trillion a year. And the deferred maintenance averages about $100 billion a year. And let me go to the next slide. So this is the basically the current spending proposals. Here's the average deferred maintenance in the United States. This is basically, as I said, like an interest charge. If you don't pay it, you uh, it increases the total. It it's, doesn't disappear. This is the current GOP plan, the um, first and the second uh, Democratic proposals. Here was an estimate made by a, a Republican-led committee um, by the National Governors Association that estimated in 1990 that there was a $3 trillion es estimate that would take 20 years to close uh, to clear, that was in 1990, and that was just transportation, and here is my low and high. So that these numbers look daunting, but it's interesting, this is the total. So what happens if you look at the amount per year? So here's my low and high of the deferred maintenance. Um, here's sort of like the average of that, and here's what's actually being spent. Here's that National Governors Association estimate at $100 billion a year to clear it. Here's what the GOP is proposing for new funding at $32 billion a year. So if you will, this is like bailing a boat. And every minute, 125 gallons rushes in. And uh, the Republicans are saying, we're going to save the ship of state. And they're bailing um, 32 gallons a minute. And at that point, of course, the ship is going to sink. But what also happens is when you underspend and don't cover the uh, deferred annual deferred maintenance, then basically you never get to the backlog. And so this is not only the a plan that will not address the backlog, it's also for accelerated decrepitude. So as Alfeca showed this slide a, a few, uh, just a few minutes ago, and she talked about replacing the systems. So one of the things that happens is when you underspend on replacing infrastructure, if the sewer pipes and say the gas main or the water main need to be replaced at the same time, but you only have enough money to replace one, it's somewhere between five and $200 a foot. You dig up this pipe, you close down the road, you put all the people who either live here or have businesses, um, you prevent them from using the road. Uh, businesses suffer losses, which if you're a utility, you have to reimburse them for, say the road is closed or, or partially disabled for some number of months. And then a few years later, another utility gets enough water, excuse me, money, say the water utility uh, to replace their pipe and you do the whole thing over again. So if you were running a, a business um, you'd go out of business going doing this because the cost will be multiplied by many orders of magnitude by constantly redigging up the road over and over again. And unfortunately, this is the path that the Republican plan currently um, is headed, headed for. 
So what goes on with deferred maintenance? So the idea behind deferred maintenance is say I have a building and someone spills their coffee in the lobby and someone gouges the wall. Do I really have to hustle out and replace the carpet and put brand new carpet there? Um, and maybe I can just patch the wall. I don't have to do a really great job and I can save a little bit of maintenance. Does it really affect the overall building? No, it's fine. So, and the idea is if I defer maintenance, oh, I'm sorry, this is time going this way and this is the relative repair cost. So if I defer a little bit of cosmetic maintenance, I'm able to bank that money and may, make maybe three to 5% a year by saving it. So that sounds pretty good. So, but the problem is that's not a road that's um, uh, supporting maybe hundreds of thousands of car trips a day. So what happens is when you actually have something exposed to the weather and constant um, use from automobiles or uh, corrosive water flowing through it, if it's a pipe, what happens is it begins to deteriorate exponentially. And as you can see, what happens is the actual repair cost accelerates way far, fa or excuse me, increases far faster than the actual savings. And so there's a little bit of initial savings and you think you're doing well. And this is always which is re um, reported by austerity um, proponents is that we're actually saving money. And then what happens is, this is a gray line here, this is concrete. So this is uh, by a gentleman by the name of DeSitter, whose dad was a famous physicist. He uh, went into civil engineering and after 20 to 30 years, he gave up, came up with his quote to Sitter's Law of Fives, which you can find on the internet. And it basically says, this is for reinforced concrete. And he basically found that after five years, if you don't fix the micro cracks in reinforced concrete, the actual cost is five times the money that you thought you saved. And if you wait another five years and you're now down at 10 years, the money that you thought you saved uh, versus what you lost, the losses are now 25 times. And if you wait 15 years to repair uh, the problems, you're now out at 125. So each time everything goes up by a factor of five. And, and this is why austerity basically, um, or underspending on maintenance, uh, wastes about $4 for every single dollar that they think they've saved. So here's an example with pavement. There are, I think, 19 states that have current um, laws, or excuse me, changes in their constitution that prevent them from uh, increasing their motor fuel tax without a ballot initiative, what happens? So here's, this is the pavement condition index. So here's brand new pavement at 100. And here's uh, something where maybe chunks are flying up in the air when you could drive over it with a condition of five. And this has failed. This has to be completely replaced. So if you're able to continually repair the pavement every two years with say um, uh, a tar coat, and a little bit of uh, sand or gravel, what happens is you can maintain it for uh, decades. But if you underspend, what happens is it basically falls off a cliff and the actual cost of repairing the uh, pavement can go up by a factor of four to eight in just two to three years. So by the time your rump, if you're driving along, tells you, hey, maybe this road needs to be repaired, you've actually increased the cost by a factor of eight if you wait that long. So lest you think this is all just smoke and mirrors, California in 2008, um, over 540 um, municipal, regional, and state agencies that are responsible for managing 84 to 87% of the pavement and the bridges in California decided to pool all of their data. And so all of this stuff is managed by what are called maintenance management systems. And they basically, the roads are chopped into little tiny segments. And every year you report what the condition of the segment is and how much you've spent on it. And so after four years um, of analyzing the data with a, a computer algorithm, they discovered that if they continued on at the current spending levels, the cost of the deferred maintenance backlog would balloon from $40 billion to six, uh, 66 billion or an additional $24 billion in just 10 years. And this is based on all real world data um, pulled out of uh, road conditions versus maintenance spending. And this stunned even the proponents of motor fuel taxes. And finally, when they were uh, able to show this data, the uh, Republican party who had prevented uh, motor fuel taxes from being increased since 1994 were um, uh, defeated and the state Senate and how, uh, assembly were able to pass a, a SB1 to increase the motor fuel taxes to avoid this catastrophic loss. So that leads us to a general discussion of paying for infrastructure and why, again, do we need the bank? As the um, conservatives have also prevented increasing the federal motor fuel tax um, since the mid 90s. And so what's happened 
to that the value of that tax. So if you look at the actual value in 1970 versus where it is now adjusted for the increase in the size of the roads, the number of roads that are being um, driven, the um, uh, traffic load and inflation, you discover that it's actually only worth now 25% of the value that it was in 1970. So what this means is, is that, well, supposedly through devolution, states were going to pick up the spending and the, the federal government was going to stop redistributing taxes all over the place and the local regions, local states would pay for their own roads. But what happened is the same crew then went out and prevented states from raising motor fuel taxes. And um, you can see this in the federal data on all of the urban roads. There are little uh, devices that measure the, what's known as the roughness index, which is, if you will, how much it's jostles and shaken as it goes over potholes. And if it was random, I'm sorry, this is uh, very high quality roads and this is poor quality roads here. And if it was purely random, you'd sort of see some sort of uh, Gaussian distribution, kind of like the, the uh, sombrero shape here, which is uh, most of it is in the middle. Um, but what happens is when pavement managers don't have enough money, what they do is they maintain the segments that people drive over the most and the ones that they drive over the least, say like rural roads, they let fall into disrepair because they don't have enough money to support everything. And so instead you get a distribution that looks like this with this peak out where the roads are really terrible. And there's no other explanation for this because if you were maintaining your roads, there's no way you let a lot of them fall into disrepair unless you had enough, didn't have enough money. And this is data from the entire nation. So let's switch now. Um, to uh, water and Alfeca talked about lead. This is Ranger, Texas. Um, Fort Worth is over here. It's about uh, 70 miles west of Fort Worth out into the plains. And um, they have, um, they're a small town. It's about 2,500 people. Um, they have 28 times the maximum EPA limit of lead in their water. One glass won't hurt you, but you certainly wouldn't want your kids drinking it. You wouldn't want to do it for more than once or twice because of course lead creates uh, uh, brain damage. So they need a new water system. It's $15 million. But um, here's their population. Uh, Ranger was an oil boom town. Their largest population was in the 20s. This is um, symptomatic of many rural towns, whether it's oil or coal or some other minerals or actually farming. Because of course, uh, today only 2% of the people raise many more quanti many more times the amount of food we had at the turn of the century when 60 to 70% of the US population was involved in producing food. And so as a result, their population keeps on dwindling. And with um, uh, only 1,500 customers and a 22% poverty rate, how is Ranger Texas ever in the world going to afford getting $15 million together to put a new water system in? And why would anyone want to move to Ranger Texas with decrepit buildings and high lead levels? Because right now what you do is you pay for water, but that's just for washing and maybe your lawn. The water you drink, you go out and buy in bottles, which as you can imagine is very expensive. So this is a symptomatic problem throughout rural America. When you look, there are about 5,000 rural towns with a population of about 4.4 million who all have, the towns have populations under 10,000 and they're more than 45 miles from the next largest town of say 50,000 or more, which means they can't be used as bedroom communities. And how are these towns ever going to compete against urban centers where there are many more job opportunities and they have decent roads and they have better schools and they have cleaner drinking water and they have broadband and they have healthcare. And so unless uh, there's a supplement from the National Infrastructure Bank, these towns are going to continue to decay and decline until they eventually disappear, which I think would be a terrible thing. So if you will, part of the National Infrastructure Bank is a mission to save rural America. Thank you very much. My name is Stan Forzik, and I'm with the uh, advisory board for the Coalition for National Infrastructure Bank. Uh, you've listened to two discussions uh, uh, about the financing of infrastructure, and it's pretty scary stuff. We seem to be in, the country seems to be in, in a ball of confusion. We really don't know which way to go. As Alfeca brought up in, in her discussion, uh, she points out that uh, the National Infrastructure Bank is needed to actually do approximately five uh, trillion dollars worth of work, which is based on 
uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers estimates as to what's needed over the course of the last 10 years. Dr. Stephen Hubbard brought up the same points, but he also explained to you that that figure is somewhat uh, uh, skewed to the low side, that it actually is somewhat higher. The components are all the same. We seem to be, again, in a state of flux. And why are we in a state of flux? We're in a state of flux because we have individuals, we have different coalitions, we have different caucuses, which come up with plans for infrastructure which are sh uh, certainly short of what the two expectations are. And they are plans. That's exactly what they are. And over the course of the last 65 years, people have been talking about plans, plans to do this infrastructure or plans to do that infrastructure. But there never seems to be enough money in the appropriations process to take care of all of these plans. The National Infrastructure Bank that we're speaking about here today is the only way to fund all of these things, to finance and fund all of these things. Not only would it bring all infrastructure up to a state of good repair, but it would go far beyond. Because even as Stephen has pointed out, there are things missing uh, in the, uh, the civil engineers exercise. And there's even more things missing, such as resiliency and cybersecurity. With the technology is not there yet. Pipelines uh, go down. Water systems dependent on, on uh, uh, systems that are not cyber secure, and that's been proven a few times. We need the National Infrastructure Bank to finance all of these infrastructure projects. Now, what else is needed? Not only do we want, does the bank want to finance all of these projects, but like Franklin Roosevelt's bank, it will put millions of people back to work. There are millions of people that are not going back to work because they're being paid more to stay at home rather than go back to work. And there's a whole underbelly of people who are not working because they gave up. And one of the reasons why they've given up is what uh, Dr. Hubbard has mentioned, and that is deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance over 15 or 20 or 25 years actually puts people out of the workforce because you're not spending the operating money or the capital money to do the projects necessary. So companies are forced not to fire, but not to hire people because their budgets do not include an acceleration of money to actually do all of the things necessary. So deferred maintenance, not only it means that we're lowering our financial standards and not getting the capital work done to fix the infrastructure, but in essence, it's not hiring people to the extent that companies and uh, local municipalities and state governments have been hiring on so that th those contractors that work on infrastructure projects don't need the people anymore because we're deferring maintenance. So we're stuck between a rock and a hard place to actually get something done. And what's happening is we're fighting amongst ourselves. We have people putting in plans, to fix infrastructure, although low, it's not enough money and it has, to, it has to be created through deficit spending or more taxes. Then someone else comes up with a plan and it, it, it sort of presents a derogatory point of view. We can do our plan better than your plan, but neither one of them have a way to finance it. The National Infrastructure Bank that we're talking about is the only way to finance all infrastructure. Just as it was uh, created back in 1791, through all the reiterations, through all of the countries that have high-speed rail, 
that have good water systems and good infrastructure. They use the same model that was created in this country in 1791 and brought all the way through 1957. And then the National Infrastructure Bank stopped. And what has occurred? There is no more infrastructure. It's decaying right in front of our eyes. So the only way that we are going to get something done as far as infrastructure is concerned is the National Infrastructure Bank. Yes, the appropriations process does fund certain agencies with Ackerman names and things that you don't really understand, and they give out grants for infrastructure. But a lot of municipalities, a lot of cities, a lot of states don't take that approach because the policies and the procedures to get that money is too hard for them to really work on and get that money. That's why the National Infrastructure Bank, again, I'm saying this again for everybody to listen, is the only real way to fund infrastructure. I appreciate the time of you folks coming into our website and getting a little bit more uh, indoctrination for the National Infrastructure Bank. I hope we provided a really good uh, uh, explanation and got a little further down into the weeds so that you can see we are in a ball of confusion, but we do have the way out. Thank you so much for your time and effort coming to the website.